Uh, okay, good morning. So, uh, today I want to talk about permutations with repetition. But before that, there was one problem left from the previous session. Uh, we want to solve it. Uh, I will solve this problem from two different perspectives. Uh, perspectives. Both of them are actually very important to at least hear about them. Okay. So let us try to prove this. I told you that there are some problems related to counting in combinatorics. Some problems are just analytic work without any connection with counting. So you just use the formula. So the only formula that you need here is P. Let me write capital N and capital R this time. So this is N factorial divided by N minus R factorial. And of course, you need to know when this formula is used in combinatorics. When it is used, when you want to, if you have a collection of n objects, distinct objects, you want to choose all of them and arrange them in a way that order in that arrangement matters. Whenever you want to count the number of possible ways to do it, you use this formula. But here you don't need to know why this formula is useful. You just need to use the formula to prove this identity, okay? And as usual, if you want to prove an identity, it is preferable to start from that side, which is more complicated, and try to simplify it and reach to the part that is to the side that is less complicated. Okay, so what we do, hopefully you agree with me, it's better to start from the right-hand side, yes? So what can I write for this one? That is exactly the same formula, but little n plays the role of capital N and little r plays the role of capital R, so I just write the formula. n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, yes? But then plus, I have one r being multiplied by this. So how should I write that? This n is playing the role of that n, so it means that this becomes n factorial, but then in the denominator, I will have the difference between them, yes? Uh, then I have the difference between them factorial. So this r minus 1 is playing the role of that r in the formula. So it becomes n minus r minus 1, and then factorial. But if I put this minus sign in, it becomes n minus r plus 1 factorial. Yes, so that is just following the formula. And then, of course, you know that I have a fraction here, a fraction there. This r is being multiplied by this fraction, so it will be only multiplied uh, to, the to the numerator. But then I have to take the common denominator. Why? Because at the left-hand side, I have only one single expression. So this motivates me to take the common denominator. And of course, usually some people take this multiplied by that as a common denominator, but that is not the optimal way of doing things, yes? It is better to find the LCD, least common denominator. How can I find that least common denominator here? Okay, let me write one more step. I copy and paste the first part. I will do some changes to the second part. The first thing is that I really go and multiply this in the numerator by putting the dot there. But this n minus r plus 1 factorial can be viewed as n minus r plus 1 multiplied by the previous number factorial. What is the previous number to this? n minus r. So it becomes n minus r factorial. So that's the famous property of factorials, yes? Instead of writing n minus r plus 1 factorial, you can write n minus r plus 1 times the previous number factorial. What is the benefit of that? Because you see that this factor appears there. So I would say that this itself is the common denominator because it, only, it includes not only itself, but also this one. So that is the common denominator. So I put the common denominator here. Okay, this denominator is being multiplied by n minus r plus 1, so I have to rescale its numerator by the same factor, yes? So it becomes n minus r plus 1 
multiplied by n factorial. But this one is exactly the same denominator, so I don't need to do any changes to the, to the numerator. Yes? Okay, what is the next step? The next step, I can collect it back again, because I didn't need, I don't need it in this form. So I collect it back to n minus r plus 1 factorial. But here, what can I do? I have n factorial here, n factorial there, so I can factor an n factorial out. So from this one, n minus r plus 1 is left. And then plus, from this one, only r is left. Yes. And now simplify this minus r and r, it becomes n plus 1 multiplied by n factorial and then divided by uh, here instead of writing n minus r plus 1 I would write n plus 1 minus r the reason that I'm motivated to do that because I ha was having an i on the other side you will see why so what happens now can I collect the numerator into some simpler form yes because that is n factorial multiplication of 1 up to n, then I am also multiplying by the next number. So it becomes just n plus 1 factorial. Yes, this becomes n plus 1 factorial. And in the denominator, that is the reason I wrote it in that way. n plus 1 minus r then factorial. Yes? Okay, so now can you see what is that? Compare this one with this formula give the role of n to n plus 1 and give the role of r to r. Yes? This becomes exactly what you have here. So this means that this is nothing except this formula for the case in which capital N is n plus 1, capital R is r. Yes? So this is exactly equal to what? P, n plus 1 and r. And that is exactly equal to the left-hand side. So I was able to show that the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side without any reference to counting problems or something like that. But another type of problems, another method of solving these problems is a very uh, powerful tool in combinatorics, and that is called a storytelling proof. Okay, a story not in the sense of a science fiction, but a real story. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So you find a story, a counting problem, and then solve that counting problem in two different ways, with two different algorithms. If your algorithms are correct, and you are not messing something up, the result should be the same. And the sameness is this equality. But of course it is hard, because you have to imagine the right story which gives you this result. Okay, so for example, let us make my story for this. Let us say that I have n plus one students. Uh, let us write student number one, student number two, student number three, student number n, and a student number n plus one. But I have only r jobs available. So let us say that I have job number one, job number two, up to job number R. Okay, let me just refresh your memory a little bit. If I ask you, so and then every job should be filled with exactly one student, okay? Of course, the number of jobs I am assuming is less than the number of students. Every job will be filled, but some students will not be employed, okay? Now my question is that, forget about this problem, I'm just refreshing your memory. In how many ways I can fill up the positions? In how many ways? That's exactly the standard problem, yes? Do you remember what was the model I told you? You have uh, marbles and you have boxes. And you want to arrange the boxes in the marbles so that in each box you receive exactly one marble. Yes? Is that right? So that is the exact model. So if I ask you that question, you will immediately answer to me. So the number of ways 
chaotic today. This is this is my story. So I have N plus one students. I have R jobs. The number of jobs is less than or equal to at most the number of students. The question is that in how many ways I can fill up the jobs. Yes. Of course, it is clear that some students will not be employed. So how can I answer this question? The number of ways that jobs are filled is equal to P N plus one and R. Agree? Okay. So, but now I want to have the same story, but I want to change my algorithm. Okay? I want to count the same number of ways. I want to see in how many ways the jobs can be filled. I already know the answer. Okay, according to the algorithm that we developed in the previous lesson. Now I want to design a new algorithm. I would say that if I want to occupy these jobs, either this last person is chosen for a job or not. Is that clear? Yes or no? So when I choose these people for these jobs, there are two possibilities. Either SN plus 1 is chosen okay or sn plus one is not chosen yes is that right okay now let us ask your opinion about this one only can you tell me in how many of those job assignments sn plus one was not in my list yes minus R, or for how many like options he will not be chosen for? Okay, so what the question, let me repeat the question. I told you that if I want to fill up the jobs, uh, there are two possibilities for this last person. Either this person gets the job, a job, or does not get a job. Okay, my question is that can you count the number of ways of these job assignments for which SN plus 1 does not get a job. Yes? Isn't it? It's P, N, and R. Why? Why? Yes? Because if I don't want to give this person a job, I can say that please go and then I can solve my problem, yes? So it means that if this person is not supposed to be chosen, then how many objects I have? N objects. How many boxes I have? R boxes. So the number of ways that I can do it according to the model is P, N, and R. Okay? But that is not the whole story. It might happen that I like that person, I want to choose it. Okay? In how many ways I can do this job assignment so that it is guaranteed this person is employed by any job, by a job. So how should I happen? What happens now? I want to choose this person. So what? Should, uh, I so it means that I take that person, I assign a job to this person. In how many ways I can assign a job to this particular person? Yes? Always, yes. Because there are all jobs available. I want to assign one job to this person. It means I have all ways to do that. Now, let us assume that this person got a job. Yes? How many jobs are available? R minus jobs are available. How many marbles, how many objects are available now? N. Then, I want to fill up the rest of the jobs with the rest of the people. In how many ways I can do that? P, what? N and R minus 1. So this means that I have to multiply them because it's in a stage 1, I give a job to person S N plus 1. After that, I distribute the people in the leftover jobs. This can be done in that way. So the, num the number of items here is this number. The number of items here is that number. So if I ask you what is the total number of items, 
It's the sum of these two. Yes? On the other hand, I know the answer is this. So they have to match. And that is this identity. Okay, so I, I did it with counting, not analytic argument. I want you to get a flavor of this kind of proof. I don't think they are very... In the book, you have one of them, very simple one. Okay? Uh, but uh, I just want you to know, it's a very important tool in the hand of mathematicians working in combinatorics. Prove these identities by storytelling. Okay, so I'm not saying that every story that you come up with solve this problem. And then you might say that, okay, I want to tell my story instead of students and jobs, I have objects and boxes. You can make up your story. But I want you to see that this is not a fiction, it is a real mathematical rigorous proof. Yes? What I did, I counted the same number of items in two different ways. If I don't make you mistakes, these numbers should be exactly the same. Yes? So this is the, this is the power of a story proofs in combinatorics. I, did do, I didn't do any calculations at all. I just imagined what's going to happen. So are you happy? Do you understand what's going on? Okay, I don't expect you to be able to cook up these stories because they might be extremely hard. Okay, but at least I want you to see it. Okay, now this lesson is finished here. Uh, we want to go to the notion of combinatorics permutations with repetitions. So far, for example, if I ask you, if I give you a word table, and I ask you how many three letter words I can construct using the letters of this word. This is a standard problem, yes? Because you will tell me that one, two, three, four, five objects, and objects are distinct. And then I want how many boxes I have. I have three boxes. So I want to distribute five distinct objects in three boxes in which order matters because constructing words naturally means all the matters, yes? Okay, so this what this is the standard problem. What's the answer? P, 5, and 3. Okay, now, uh, if I give you how many five-letter words are there, you also can answer that. What that is? Five factorial, or if you want to use this model, you can. You, you just write P, 5, and 5, which you calculate, it becomes five factorial because of the convention of zero factorial to be one. But now if I change my word, so let us say that I want to write the word beer. And then I ask you how many four letter words you can construct using the word letters in this word. And I told you, this is by convention, that when I ask this question, it means that B, you have one B, two E's, and one R. Okay, so E has to repeat two times, no more, okay? So in how many ways I can do that? So if all of them are different, then it should be four factorial. But what is your intuition? Do you think the new answer is less than four factorial, more than four factorial or equal, yes? It should be less. Because in the case, in the previous case, if I interchange E's, I, this gives rise to a new situation. In this case, if I change two E's, this is still the same word, beer. So some of them, I have to cross them over. Okay, but we have to do it a little bit systematically. I will start with this one, try to understand it. Okay, the method that usually people use to describe it, they say that, okay, beer is one of those combinations. Let us pretend that these E's are different. What does it mean? Let us equip them with one, index one and two. Okay, so then what happens? So they are not distinct, but let us pretend that they are distinct. And then what you do, I want to keep the positions of B and R the same all the time and do whatever you can do, permute them among themselves. So if I keep B and R the same, is there any way that I can permute them? Yes, it becomes E2 and E1. But look, imagine that these indices are gone. Then this word and that word are the same. But if their indices are there, these two words are two words. Is that understandable? Let us say that, okay, 
Let us write another combination which is really different from the word beer. For example, you can write E E B R. Okay? Now again, imagine that I assume that they are distinct. Again, the same rule. Keep the location of B and R the same. And then try to see how many ways you can permute E's among themselves. Okay, so how many ways? Again, two. Yes? Uh, and then, for example, let us see another one. So be careful. If these indices are gone, and these indices are gone, these two are the same. These two are the same, but these are not the same. Even if you eliminate the indices. Is that clear? So in so far, for this problem, how many items I have written? Two. two. But in the form of four. Okay? Every two of them will be one item if I remove the indices. Okay? And then again, let me another combination. For example, what do you think? E, B, E, R, uh, E, B. And let me equip them with index one and two. And again, the same rule. I want to keep the location of B, R and B the same. Permute E and E among themselves. So it becomes E2 and E1. Okay? If the indices are there, so far I have written six items. But if you remove the indices that I have to remove because they are not distinct, how many items you see? Three. Okay? But let us continue this idea. One thing is that clear. If I continue writing all possibilities in that way, I have some columns, but the depth of each column is how much? Two, 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 etc. But this two is exactly two factorial, actually. Because I have two objects, I want to change them. So it's two factorial. But of course, in this case, if you are not comfortable with two factorial, just write two. But one thing is that my question is the number of columns. I am looking for the distinct items. So I told you that this item and that item are the same, but these items are distinct from this item. So if I ask you so far how many items I have written for my problem, you will tell me three items. Why? Because I have written three columns. Okay? So I hope that you agree with me. If I continue this, the number of columns that I generate is the answer to my question. Could I motivate you for that? Is that clear? Okay, so the number of items, of course the number of columns I still don't know. I call it X. Yes? So the number of columns, I want you to understand that. The number of columns is the answer to my question about how many words I can write with the letters in the word beer. Yes? That was the only thing that I wanted to motivate you sometimes. Uh, so far. Okay. Now, can you tell me how many items are in this table at the end? If I am patient and I write everything down, the number of items in the table. Yes. Is what? Four factorial based on my previous knowledge. Why? Because if I, consist, if I consider that E's are different, it means that I am doing the same problem as before. So the total number of these items that appear everywhere in this table should be 4 factorial on the one hand. Yes? Yes or no? But what is the number of items on the other hand? What is the number of tables in the other hand? X? Two. So what's the number of items there in the table? X? No, no. What is the total number of items here? I have X columns. Each column has two items in it. Listen to my question first. I have a table. X columns. Each column, two items. Why 2 factorial? 2x. Yes? 2x. Why you should divide? You need to count the number of items you see. I have x columns, each column 2 items. <laughs> no, these are... No, these are... I'm just counting the number of items. Oh, don't confuse me. I mean, I mean, this is very simple. I'm asking you a very simple question, you know? I have 
three pens here, three pens here, three pens here. How many pens I have? Three times three. I have three pens here. How many pens I have? Three times four. Yes? So how many items you see here? Two times x. But two times x is the number of items here. Four factorial is also the same number of items here. So I am counting the number of items in two different ways. Once from primary school way, that for some reason you don't know, I don't know why, and from perspective of distinct objects arranged in distinct locations. Yes? But these two numbers should match. Yes or no? Because I'm counting the same number of items. So it means 2x is equal to 4 factorial. But what was the question that I'm answering? Do you remember? It was x. So if I find x, that's my answer. So x is found. x is nothing except 4 factorial divided by 2. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, so that's it. So the answer to this question is not 24. It's 24 divided by 2, 12. So there will be 12 four-letter words that I can construct using the letters in this word beer. Yes? Yes or no? Okay. I want you to, if you don't understand, please let me know, because I want to make the problem a little bit harder. And then from that, we want to extract a model. I don't want to repeat this all the time. Okay, this formula will not be in the formula sheet, but the questions are in the book. So either you have to remember the formula that I derived for you here, or you have to start from scratch all the time. Yes? You finished that by Victoria. Did that answer to the or did you forget to do that? No, this is finished. This is a different. This, the, the problem starts from here. You wrote the number of three letter words. Shouldn't it be five pictures divided by two pictures? For the permutation for that. Okay, that's a different story. Yes, that is correct. But that is not, has, has nothing to do with repetition. Yes, that was a review. I told you that for this case, that I want to choose a sub-collection of my objects, if the objects are distinct, then I have a formula. Yes, in this formula, it's 5 factorial divided by 2 factorial. But it, the problem is finished here. A new problem is started. And now I want to ask the same question. So here in this question, if I want to use all of them, it's 5 factorial. If I want to choose a sub-collection of them, this is this number. But beer has division even though I want to use all of them, not a sub-collection of them. Yes? Okay, now let us go to another word. Let us consider the word pepper, yes? Okay, so let us try to understand this. Again, if I want to know how many six let one, two, three, four, five, six, how many six letter words I can use, I can construct using the letters in this word. So what does it mean by convention? It means I have exactly three P's and I have exactly two E's and one R. And I want to use them to construct my six letter words. I want to use the same strategy. Okay? What is my strategy? For example, I pretend that P's are all different and E's are all different. It means that I equip them with indices. Somehow I differentiate between them. Yes? So this is if you the point is that be careful these are artificial ones i am bringing them in this is not supposed to be there these are identical p's identical e's okay but let us pretend that this is the case but what i am t telling you follow the same rule what is the rule the rule is that the ones or one that is not repeated keep the same location for it so r is this but Start permuting P's among themselves. So it means that if this location, this first location, second location, third, fourth, fourth, fifth, and second, yes? I want to dedicate location 6 for R, locations 1, 3, and 4 for P's, locations 2 and 5 for E's. Yes? This is your constraint. I, I am, you are allowed to permute them in any way that you like and write them below, but one constraint or two constraints. P's should be, should be always in locations 1, 3, and 4. E's should be always in locations 2 and 5. So let us write some of them. For example, I will write E1 here. Let us concentrate to keep these for the time being. I choose to write P2 here. I choose to write P1 here, P3 here. Am I following my rule? Yes. yes. Because I am 
putting P's in those locations and putting E's in the other locations uh, that I told you. This is one possibility. Okay? Another possibility, let me keep E's exactly the same places for the time being. But I can write P3 here and then P2 here and P1 here. That's also following my rule. But let me tell you, for my original problem, how many items I have written? For the problem that I want to solve? One. Because if I remove the indices, all of them will be the same word. Yes? But so far, how many I have written? Three. My question for you is that, now let us, for example, choose, I don't know, choose P2, P1, P3 here. Let me put E2 here, E1 here, R here. That is also uh, acceptable. Okay? But again, if I remove the indices, still I am generating the same word. Now my question for you is that, let us concentrate on these locations. What will be the depth of this column? Think about it. Don't spoil the problem, okay? So you understand what I'm telling. Location 1, location 3, and location 4 is dedicated for P's. Location 2 and location 5 are dedicated for E's. Location 6 is for uh, R. If I stick to this rule and start being, I'm being patient to write all the items down, what do you predict for the depth of this column? Yes? Three factorials times two. Three factorials times two factorials. Why is that? Because you say that to construct this, I have a two-stage task. Because R is always there, I don't care. My task is to distribute three distinct objects in three distinct locations. In how many ways I can do that? Three factorial. Now let us say this stage is done. Then my duty is to distribute E's. I have two distinct E's and I have two distinct locations. In how many ways I can do that? Two factorial. So if I want to do both stages, I have to multiply them. So this is what I want to convince you, that so the depth of this is nothing except three factorials times two factorial. Is that right? Okay, but all these items, I'm, so this will be 12, I am not patient to write all of them. But if I remove the indices, how many items I have written so far for my problem? One. one. But all of them will collect into one. Okay? Okay, but I hope that you agree there are other combinations. For example, this time, let me dedicate location 2 for R. Let me dedicate this for E and this one for P this one for P, this one for E, uh, is that right? We have one more P. So let us consider this one. So E1, uh, this one, P2, and this P3, and this is E2. So this time, location one, location two, location three, location four, five, and six. But the rule is the same. I, if this location is for R, I want to keep R always here, Location number one and location number five, five will be dedicated to E's. Locations three, four, and six will be dedicated to P's. Okay? And I, I, I will start permuting them. I hope that you agree with me. If I am patient and right, the, the depth of this column will be the same. Is that right or not? Yes. Okay. But now, so far, how many items for my problem I have? Okay. Two. Okay? And then I write another one, another one, then I will have these columns. Okay? And then the number of columns, I want to motivate you again. Do you agree the number of columns is my x? The one that I want to find. Yes? yes? Okay. Again, I want to do the same thing. So, how many items you will see if you are really patient and write everything down? You can count it in two distinct ways. You say on the one hand, I see the permutation of six distinct objects in all the all of them, which on the one hand is what? Six factorial. On the other hand, primary school way of calculating the number of items is what? The depth times the width. Yes? So the width is actually this, and the depth is that one. So I multiply three factorial times two factorial times x. 
So, but this number should be the same because I'm counting the same number of items in two different ways. So these two should match. Yes or no? Yes. But I am looking for x. So x is nothing except 6 factorial divided by 3 factorial, 2 factorial. So if you understand that and use this formula, this formula is not in the book uh, or in the formula sheet, but I want you to understand that. It is now I hope that you see the algorithm. Yes? Do you see what happens? If all the objects are distinct, I just simply write 6 factorial. Okay? But then I see three P's are repeated, so I put the three factorial because of repetition of P's. And I see two E's are repeated, so I put the two factorial because of repetition of uh, E's. And if you want, you can write one factorial for one R, but one factorial is just simply one, we don't need to write it down. Is that right? So the algorithm is clear. Okay? Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the new lesson. So now you don't need to be worried. This is a model in your ha head again. So here, if I want to model it as marbles, so I have some number of marbles, but some of them are identical. They are not distinguishable. But the locations are all distinguishable. They are distinct boxes. Okay, and I want to arrange them in those boxes, in which in every box I receive exactly one marble. Yes, this model is according to this formula. Okay, now let us, for example, this is a very a famous word in combinatorics. <laughs> you will see why. So, let me say how many 11, this is a standard question. So, how many 11? Leather words one can construct, can one construct using uh, the letters in the word. Okay, the, the Mississippi. It's a very good word for combinatorics. Yes. Okay, so just answer that. I want to wait for you. Uh, okay, you raise your hand first. Uh, 11 factorial divided by 4 factorial times 4 factorial times 2 factorial. Yes. That's right. What did you do first? Uh, I count all the letters. This is important to count because it is not a priori clear. Yes, this is the this is the reason I unfortunately clean that there is no formula like P and an R for repetition. Unfortunately, I will come to that later. But the important thing is that you have to count if you have eleven objects, and we have. So let me write Mississippi like this. Let me see, see. Yes. So this is Mississippi. Okay. So first you have to count because if the question is eight letter, forget about it. It is extremely hard. If I ask you how many eight letter words you can construct using Mississippi, it is not the case. It's not like the case that we have the formula for it. There is no formula for it, and you will understand why I will explain. But this is the important thing, that when you see repetition, count the number of objects you have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then you see that's exactly 11, so that's exactly to according to our model. Okay? If every, everything was distinct, uh, everything were distinct, you just write 11 factorial. But this is not the answer now, because you see that, 1, 2, 3, 4 is repeating themselves, so it becomes 4 factorial because of that. 1, 2, 3, 4 because of that. 2 because of that. And that is simple. So that's why I really want you to know this rule, because if you want to discover this in the exam, this formula is not there, so it's better to know it. And that's the answer, and just leave it like this. Uh, any questions here? Yes? Yes? 
Okay, now let me ask you another question. Can you answer this question? In how many of these uh, permutations all i's are adjacent? Okay, don't spoil the problem. I want to take a little bit of time to solve the problem. I want to solve the same problem, but I want to have all i's immediately next to each other. No, don't answer. I want to wait. Uh, okay, so do you have your answers? You want to just tell me, I write it down and then we do it together. Okay, uh, seven factorial over seven factorial yes. over four fa factorial times two factorial. This is your answer. Yes. Okay, so ah. yes, uh, eight factorial divided by four factorial times two factorial. Okay, so that's simple. You have a different answer? Yes? I have the same as Yes? Yes? Ask Okay. So, what was your name, sir? Tom. Yes? Okay, so we vote for this. Yes. But why? I don't know. I have to calculate myself. Do you have an opinion? Okay, but why should it be hard? Because you know this model. We, we, you have a lot of experience now. But if you want to have all these things next to each other, what was the idea? To put them in a box or something. Yes? So if I put it in a box, and then don't look it inside, you have non-homogeneous objects. Okay, one of them is a box. The others are letters. But who cares? These are objects. Okay? And now... What do you see? You see this. And I want to arrange these objects. Okay? So how many objects are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight factorial should be in the numerator. Yes? But now uh, you have to divide it by what? This object is not repeated. What about this object? It's not repeated. It's just one single rectangle. And then one, two, three, four is repeated four times. And this repeated two times. So two factorial. Yes? So that's the answer. Any questions? Okay, let me ask you another question. Here, I want you to calculate the number. I don't want you to tell me, because if you tell me in that way, people understand your algorithm. So let us consider the word balloon. Okay? How many letters are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. My question is that, how many seven letter words are there? This is simple. Se seven letter words are there. So let us answer this quickly. So what's the answer? For seven letter words, I have seven factorial as usual. But because I see some items are repeated, that is not the old model, this is the new model. Okay? So B is not repeated, forget about it. A is not repeated. L is repeated two times. O is repeated two times. So that's the answer. Now, my question is this now In how many seven letter words? constructed using the letters of this word, L's are not adjacent. Okay? So, L's are not adjacent. This is a simple uh, question. Yes? It's not hard. It's a good question. Because the people who know the previous lessons and today's lesson, they can solve this problem. It's not computationally hard. I want you to find a number, not in factorial form. I wait for it. Do you have your answers? I would write it down. I don't have it. What is the final number? 900. 900. Many. Yes? 18. Doubled, you mean. Yes? I agree with number. Many. Yes. I'm 
Any numbers? Other numbers? Okay, so let us see which one is correct. How do you analyze the problem? For this one, it's not hard. It's not the hard one. Because I have two items uh, involved. And I don't want to have them adjacent. So how can I solve the problem? One with... As a complement rule, uh, yes? So what I do, I already know the total number of items without any constraints. And then exactly like the one that we did here, I count the number of items in which L's are adjacent and take it off from the total number of items. What is left are the items in which L's are not adjacent. Yes? This level I really expect you to know. It's not a hard problem. Okay? So the total number of items, this is already here. And now can you tell me in how many way, in how many of them L's are adjacent? I use the same trick. I have B, I have A, but L and L, I put it in a box, and then I have O and O, and then N. So in how many ways L's are adjacent, how many objects you see? One, two, a rectangular object, three, four, five, six. So it is six factorial, but this is not the answer because one object is repeated two times. So it is two factorial. So if someone asks you what this is, this is the total number of items in which L's are adjacent. This is the total number of items I have. But I want the total number of items in which L's are not adjacent. Is it, is it natural to take it off from that? That's the complement rule, yes? That's the answer. So it might be in the exam I accept this answer. But for this case, to practice this a little bit, I want you to find a number. Without calculator, it's also possible. So this might be a part of the question, because these numbers are not extremely big. So what is your opinion about it? How do you want to solve it? For example, I don't know in any way that you like you can do it, but this one I can write 7 times 6 factorial. 6 factorial over 2 factorial, 6 factorial over 2 factorial. I prefer to factor it out. Then what is left for me is 7 over the other 2 factorial, which is 7 over 2 minus 1. Yes, but 7 over 2 minus 1 is what? So 6 factorial is 6 factorial, this is 2. 7 over 2 minus that one is 5 over 2. Am I right? Yes? Okay, so 6 factorial, I have it in my memory. If you don't, you have to multiply, but many of them can be simplified, okay? So 6 factorial is 720 divided by 2, 360 divided by 2, 180 multiplied by 5 is 900. That's correct. Yes? Okay, if you couldn't solve this problem, either you made a mistake or you really didn't know. If you don't know, you have to ask me. Is this calculation uh, understandable? Okay, but now do you remember another algorithm we had for these problems? The benefit of that algorithm was in the case that if I have three more, uh, th three elements that I don't want to be next to each other at all, okay? So this method will not work for that case, but there is another alternative. So what was the algorithm? Do you remember? I arrange the other letters first, then I see them. And then you have some spaces in between and fill them up. So let us solve this problem. I want to test your understanding again. So this another method to solve the problem is I consider B, A, O, O, and N. Forget about those problematic ones. In how many ways I can arrange them in a row? In how many ways? No, 5 factorial divided by 2 factorial, because always repeated two times. So the number of arrangements is 5 factorial over 2 factorial. So let us say I arrange them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5. Yes, this is the number of ways that I can arrange these letters in which one of them is repeated two times in a row. And then I get some empty places that I fill up with L's, okay? So this is the first stage. Assume that this is done. Let us say B is here, O is here, N is here, O is here, and then what is left, A is here. Let us say that this is done in the one way. Now I have these up, uh, spaces, one, two, three, four, five, six spaces, and I have two L's in my hand. 
So tell me. What? P of 6 and 2. Is that understandable? This model should come to your mind. Why it is P and 6 and 2? Because how many locations I have? I have six distinct boxes. How many objects I have? Two objects. You might say that these objects are not distinct. Okay? Let us think in that way. Instead of looking at the objects, take your pen and mark the, num mark the positions. Yes? And how many ways I can do this marking? Yeah, that's a that's probably we haven't studied that yet. So, okay. It is not P, is it? It is not P. So we haven't studied that yet because L's are the same. When you say P, P is sensitive to writing two different ways. Okay? It considers two different cases. L here, L here, P considers the other way around, which is not the case. We don't want to have this. So what can you say? If you, if you write by P, yes, I will go with you. So this is 6, 2, but this is not correct. Can you predict what will be the answer here? That will be 1,800. Yes, because it is considering that because this formula can only take care of distinct objects. You cannot use the model for distinct objects for this one that the model that the objects are not distinct. So let us see if my prediction is correct or not. So this becomes 5 factorial over 2 factorial. What is P6 and 2? So it is 6 factorial over 4 factorial, yes? So this 5 factorial and this one are gone, 5 is left. And this one is again the same. No, it is double. You see, it becomes 1800. Because this is 720, and then you multiply, divide it by 2, 360, and you multiply it by 5 is that one. Why this mistake is coming? Because you are using this formula, which can model distinct objects. But you are using this. But of course, if you understand what is going on, you could have divided this by 2. Yes, because this formula thinks L's are different. But you yourself know that L's are not different. So what do you do? Just divide by two. Okay? So, sorry. This is not, this was not a good way of solving. But still, you can find a way. Okay, any questions? The last part of this uh, lesson is that we do not have any formula simple as P for the case that we have repetitions allowed. Okay? So let us try to... This doesn't mean that this is a hard problem. But this is a case-by-case -case problem, okay? We cannot find a formula in its full generality for every case. So let me start with a very simple uh, uh, problem, and I want to rely on your intuition to solve it, okay? So let me write this example. Uh, let me, it is, it is a subtitle, but let me write, you see, let me just review. We had permutations, and then we had R permutations. Yes? Today, we learned permutations. Yes? So this was, if I want to say what was the formula here, it was n factorial. What was the formula here? P, N, and R. Yes? This one, permutation with repetition, we learned today, it's n factorial, for example, divided by n1 factorial, n2 factorial, I don't know, nr factorial, some factorials. Yes? But for this one, there is no formula. Yes? So if I want to have n distinct objects, if I want to consider r permutations, I have this formula. If I want to have permutations with repetitions, I have my model, something like that. But there is no... A counterpart for this when it comes to R permutations with repetitions. So you have to solve the problem case by case. For example, let me start with this very simple problem. Uh, I have two letters of A and one letter of B and one letter of C. Okay, my question is that how many two letter, two letter words I can construct using these items? So it means that you have A's, two, two A's, one B, one C, 
but you don't want to construct four uh, letter four letter words that was easy it is four factorial divided by two factorial now my question is that how many two letter words one can construct do you understand this is the analog of our permutation but with repetition and I'm telling you there are no formulas for that you have to solve them case by case okay it is not hard for example let us say that this problem is given to you can you solve that problem you have to use the sum rule in an, in an efficient way you have to categorize the problem into different categories non overlapping categories and count them and add them up so for example what you say I want to construct a two letter word. The problematic one is this A one. So let us do some partition on it. Either in my words, I use two A's or one A's or no A's. Is that right? This is the, there is no other possibility. This is why I want to make a two letter word out of these letters. Either I use both A's, then I have this scenario, or I use one a or i use no a's so so let me write it. the number of a's is either zero one or at most two yes so if i ask you how many two letter words i can construct in which i am using two letters a how many one and that is word a a yes so i this one is extremely simple one item okay how many this this one is also extremely simple if i don't use any a's and i insist to make a two letter word how many ways i can do that i ignore them i have two objects two factorial or as you said two yes so and then here i have some problems i have one letter of a and then of course i have other choices this problem is extremely simple of course you can write them down but don't write them down so if i want to have one a then I have a choice for my second one. Yes? So I would say a stage one is choosing the next letter. How many choices I have? Two. Two. Either I can choose B or C. So I, if I insist to have one A, because I want to have a two-letter word, I need another letter. How many options are there available for me for choosing the next letter? Two. Now, let us say that the stage one is done. What does it mean? It means I made my mind about which letter I want to choose. Let us say it is B. Now, what, what do I have in my hand? I had already A in my hand. Now I have B in my hand. I want to arrange them. In how many ways I can do that? Two, two or two factorial again. But now, what is the answer to this problem? Yes? Yes, how many, how many, uh, what's the answer? It is five. You are supposed to add. So do you remember the first session I told you that you will start confusing between addition and multiplication? Because I am saying that this is the total number of A's. I can construct the words. In these items, either there are two A's, or one A, or no A. <laughs> this is this two factorial is the number of items in the last box. Yes. Yeah, but when you have one A, right? No, no, but don't get confused. You know, let me write here. This is the total number of two letter words. I will put them in this box. Yes. In this box, I have two letter words. Some of these two letter words does not have any A's. Yes? So, zero A's. Some of them has exactly one A, and some of them has exactly two A's. Is that right? Yes. Now, I am, not, I am counting these number of items in each one of these parts. And if I want to know the total number of the items in the box, I have to add them, not multiply them. Is that right? Because I misunderstood. I thought you meant the answer for... Ah, okay, okay. So, no, the answer to the question mark, to the, to the problem. So the number of items here, two A's is one, 
only one item. What which let which word is that A A? Okay? Here, which words are here? B C and C B. Okay, but I don't want you to do it because it's so simple here, we can count. We can write all of them. But there are two of them here. So two of them here, one of them here. How many of them are there? Two again. Why this is two? Because I put one A there, I choose another letter two ways, and then I arrange them two ways. Yes, so I made a mistake myself. Ah, uh, yes, now you understand yeah. what you mean. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, very much. So, sorry. So this one is two times two. That one itself. So yes, thank you very much. Sorry for that. So you are telling me that I have to multiply this to count the number of items here. That's correct. No, that was my bad. Sorry. Is that right? So then I have to add them. So what's the answer? It's seven. Sorry. And then I told you that this becomes problematic, you know, because you have to consider. And that is natural that there is no formula because it depends to which num how many things are being repeated and how many, uh, how many letter words you want to construct. So that is what I'm saying. That it, This is the most annoying problem in combinatorics because there is no formula for it and you have to make sure that you're considering all cases. Okay, so let me test you if you can solve that problem. Uh, so, let me write like this. So, for these R permutations with repetitions, you have to solve case by case. So, for example, I have given this example. Uh, Okay, so let us say that I have five A's. One, two, three, four, five. And how many B's I have written? So I have to be careful here because it would be very annoying. So eight B's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So I have eight B's and five A's. My question is that how many seven letter word I can construct? Okay, how many seven letter word I can construct using these items? If I ask you how many 13 letter words I can construct in a matter of seconds, you should be able to answer. What's the answer? 13 factorial, 13 factorial divided by 5 factorial, 8 factorial. But as soon as I have to choose a collection of it, the headache starts. Okay, but of course, uh, yeah, try to do it. You see, you can do it or not. How many seven letter? Did I say seven? Uh, how many seven letter? Yes, seven letter words. Yeah, try to don't uh, don't find the final answer. Write everything in terms of factorials. Yes, is that clear what to do? Yeah, it might be lengthy, but it is not hard at all. So I don't know how you partition the problem. So you want to construct a seven-letter word. So in that seven-letter word, you might have seven Bs, yes? Or you might have six Bs. That's the same thing, five Bs, four Bs, yes? There is some limitation. So if you, you can imagine something like this. I might have seven Bs, zero As, yes? I can, because I want to construct a seven letter word, I can use all B's. Or I can have six B's and one A. I can have, what, what? Five B's and two A's. Four B's and three A's. And then three B's and four A's. And then maximally what? Two B's and five A's. Because I will not have more than five A's. So that's the only thing that I can do. But is it simple now? Yes. What is the answer to this part? Seven B's only. One. Or if you want to use the formula for repetition, you write seven factorial, but divided by seven factorial. Which of course is one. This one is what? Seven factorial divided by six factorial. Because I have six B's, one A. And then what is the next one? 7 factorial again divided by 
5 factorial, 2 factorial, and then four, 7 factorial again, divided by 4 factorial, 3 factorial. Then this one is 7 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial. And then that one finally 7 factorial, 2 factorials, and 5 factorials. And then I add them up. Yes? So if that is given in the exam, probably that's enough. Or if you have a calculator available, you can calculate this. Is that right? That was the question. Okay, now my question is this. Uh, how many 12 letter words are there? Okay, the reason I bring it up, not because I want you to do the process again, but I want you to draw your attention to be smart. Yes. Uh, there is a very nice trick. So I will talk a little bit today, but we can discuss it later. So let me say that I have n distinct objects. So let me write like that. I have 13 distinct objects. This is not my problem, of course. Distinct objects. If I ask you uh, how, in how many ways I can arrange 12 of them, the answer is clear. Yes? I have distinct objects. What's the answer? P of 13 and 12. Okay? But let us calculate this. Might be it gives you a little bit of hint. So, what is the answer? It is 13 factorial. Divided by what? The difference between them, 1 factorial. And it becomes 13 factorial. Is it surprising or not? It should be a little bit. <laughs> Why? Because the answer is coincidentally, or there is a rule for it, is the same number of permutations of all the objects. It is 13 factorial. Is that right? So it is not that obvious why it happens. Of course, if you don't want to think about it, you've got the answer, the answer is correct. But it should be interesting. Why? If I use all the objects, or if I use one less objects, the total number of items should be the same. Of course, the items are not the same. In these items, I use all 13 objects, but in the next scenario, I pick only 12 of them and arrange them. Definitely the items are not the same items. The first items consists of 13 objects. The second items consists of 12 objects. But according to the calculation, which is definitely true and tr correct, the number of these items and the number of those items are exactly equal. Now my question is that can you bring up a story to prove this? When, when the lesson is finished, do you know? Oh, okay, we have time. So, can you come up with the storytelling that why this is true? And this is not a coincidence. Do you agree with me? What was the difference? So, in principle, if I have n and n minus 1, whatever n is, the answer becomes always n factorial. Calculate. n factorial on top. The difference between them, factorial. But the difference is 1. So 1 factorial is 1. And this is always true. Okay? So you might say that, okay, the answer shows me this is the case, why I should bother. But can you understand why it's going like that? Understanding this is a very important tool. We will discuss a little bit about that in our lesson. Yes? Okay, so these numbers are big. So let me start with simple numbers. So let us say that I have 3 and 2. Okay, so if I ask if I have three objects, one possibility is to, so let me say that I have three distinct objects. One possibility is to arrange all of them. Yes, so let me write them. That's not that much. A, B, C, A, C, B, and then B, a, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, B, A. Do you agree? These are all possible objects there. 
This method that I want to describe you is called one-to-one -one correspondence. Correspondence, yes. So for example, let us say that I am illiterate and I don't know how to count. Okay, but I have three pens here. I don't know this is three. I, I have these pens here and I have papers in my hands. Yes, okay. I put one paper below this, one paper below this, and one paper below this, I see that they match. Even without knowing the numbers are equal, I know that they have to be the same numbers. Because I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these objects and that objects. If, if when I arrange, there is more paper left in my hand, I know, without knowing which one, which number is this, I know I have more papers. If I put... Uh, papers here and papers are finished, pencil is without, but I know that the number of pens is more. So without counting, without knowing what number is the number of pens, what number is the number of papers, if I have the one-to-one -one correspondence, I know this number, whatever it is, is the same number of this, whatever this is. It's an extremely powerful, simple idea, but powerful tool. So you see here, uh, what I tell you, I want to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between these items and two permutations, okay? My rule is to say this, whenever you see an item, drop the last one, okay? This is the rule. If you follow my rule, you drop the last one, you get AB. You see this one, you drop the last one, you get AC. You drop this one, you get what? BA. Here you get BC. Here you get CA. And here you get CB. If I ask you what are these, you will tell me these are two permutations. If I ask you what are these, you are telling me these are three permutations. But they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So the number of these items and the number of these items should be the same, even if I don't know what the number is. Is that right? Is that understandable what I'm doing? So I am drawing a rule in, in a way that you know so you see, assume that you have all two permutations here, you have all three permutations here, and I want to give you a rule that associate one, of, one and only one of these items to one and only one of these items. If I can set up a rule like that, it means I could establish the one-to-one -one correspondence. And if I could establish a one-to-one -one correspondence, regardless of what number of items is here, what number of items there, they are equal in size. Is that right? So that is the reason that number of three permutations should be equal to the number of two permutations. Is that right? And then you can repeat this for higher ones. But the point is that this question was designed for distinct objects. I want you to think about this point. Do you think we can extend that idea for this case as well? So here, if I ask you how many 12 letter words you can construct, this is the same idea, 13 in total, 12, one less. But it might not be true, this one-to-one -one correspondence that I made here. You want, I want you to think about it. Do you think it is still true if I have repetitions or not? So this is the open question for you uh, to think about if you are interested. Okay, any questions? So next time I will actually, then I, I don't know, this book, they just paid, teach you in one page, but in the problems, they have all sorts of problems. Another permutation I saw today is the circular permutation. That's also in the book. So we have to go through that. So next time, I will complete this a little bit, and then we will start uh, circular permutations. Any questions? Thank you.